all right what is going on youtube here we go dawn of the dukes is out and we're going to take a look at the two new civilizations that were added to the definitive edition version of age vampires 2 this video will be talking about the pose and the, the next one will be talking about the bohemians so the pose a long time missing civilization from the age vampires franchise finally got added Let's talk about how they look like in the game. First off, let's talk about their civ bonuses. Starting with the fact that they're a cavalry civ, but this is a little bit misleading. We'll talk about that in a moment why. But what's more important is their civ bonuses. Villagers will regenerate HP over time, which is a pretty nice bonus, I would say. Makes it much harder to raid the paws. Especially, this could be useful in late game. When there is like waves of light cavalry raiding you, it's nice to have uh, your wills regenerate some HP over time. It's not like a groundbreaking or a brutal bonus by any means, but it's a nice auxiliary bonus. The Fallwark replaces the mill. We'll talk about this building in detail a little bit later. But it's basically a mill and a house together that also gives you some additional bonuses. Meaning that the openings of Pose will be slightly different because the cost of the Fallwark is also higher than the cost of a mill. Stone miners generate gold in addition to stone. This is a nice little bonus as well. But once again, it's not something that's super, super brutal. It's a nice auxiliary bonus, could be useful for maps like Arena, where you maybe don't want to mine gold, you just want to mine stone and uh, sell a little bit of a stone to go up to Castle Age and then build additional town centers from it. I can see that bonus being useful there. Their unique units, the Obuch and the Winged Hussar, we'll talk about these in a moment as well, as well as their uh, unique technologies. Now, their team bonus is Scouts, Light Cav, and Hussar have plus one attack versus Archers. This is very similar to what the Persians have. The Persians have it for Knights, they do have it for uh, Light Cavalry. It's a little bit situational, I would say, because in team games you don't usually see a lot of Light Cavalry being used, but Pause might be slightly different in that case. We'll see some examples of that in a moment. So, let's talk about their tech tree over here. They do have uh, Arbalest available with Thumb Ring. So, despite the fact that they are called a Cavalry Civilization, their Archer line is definitely above average. They do have Heavy Cavalry available, but they're missing Part and Tactics, and they're also missing Hand Cannoneer. What's even worse for Paws is that not only are they missing part in tactics, they're missing ring archer armor. So the thing is that their cav archers are capped at a pretty low pierce armor. They are totally viable because they still have thumb ring, they still have bloodlines and husbandry. So Polish cav archers are viable, but they're not as good as even standard cav archers of other civilizations that do have part in tactics and uh, ring archer armor. The fact that ring archer armor is missing also means that their skirmishers are kind of underwhelming in Imperial Age. Looking at their infantry line, they do have a fully upgraded champion. So they do have Blast Furnace, they do have Plate Mail. Once again, not something that you would commonly associate with a cavalry civilization like Paws. They are, however, missing Habadir, which is a massive loss. Most of the civilizations that are missing Habadir have something to make up for that. That is, for example, Garden Wars for Aztecs or Chieftains for Vikings or Genoese crossbows being available for Italians, but Poles entirely lacking Habadir could cause problems for them. Now, seeing that they're lacking Habadir and seeing that their skirmishers are also missing their final armor upgrade, you could tell that, hmm, their late game trash composition is not that amazing. The reality is that they are very heavily shifted towards the Winged Hussar play over here, which is a new unique unit only available for two civilizations, the Poles and the Lithuanians. It does replace the standard Hussar for Lithuanians, and it's a slightly stronger version of the Hussar. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Poles are lacking Paladin, but the bigger thing that they're lacking is a Plate Barring Armor, which is a massive surprise to me, to be honest, because... Usually, when we talk about cavalry sieves, we talk about at least full armor upgrades for them. The main problem with missing the armor upgrade is that the arbalests of the enemy will just eat your cavalry. If you ask yourself the question how often you see Japanese cavalier in team games, you will sort of understand how bad it is to lack the plus 4 defense upgrade. Japanese do lack that as well, and you rarely see their cavalry in Imperial, or at least in ideal circumstances. So... Well, their cavalry is actually fairly well upgraded, and you see already in the left side the unique upgrade that we're going to talk about a little bit more, that their knights cost uh, a lot less gold if you get this. 
their late game cavalry is somewhat uh, underwhelming, or at least their late game heavy cavalry because of lack of armor. They make up for that with a lot of uh, uh, good winged hussars, though. These are a slightly version, a slightly better version of the standard hussar. Uh, if we do a little bit of a comparison over here, the standard Hussar starts with 75 base HP. This starts with 80, so there is some extra health on top of this one. What is more interesting, though, is that this has 9 base attack, whereas uh, a standard Hussar does only have 7. So the damage output from this guy is a lot bigger. And if you look here to the left, once again, the Lechtic Legacy Unique deck also gives them a chance to do area damage, just like uh, Cataphracts. So the damage output from Winged Hussars is a lot bigger than Standard Hussars if you get all the upgrades for them. Winged Hussars also have one extra melee armor compared to Standard Hussars. They have one base melee armor, whereas Standard Hussars have zero, but their starting pierce armor is the same. So because their starting pierce armor is the same, they still suffer from uh, the fact that they could die to archers pretty easily including Castle Fire probably as well, because they're lacking that final armor upgrade. So these Winged Hussars are more like, do a lot of damage, but die relatively easy um, style units rather than about survivability. The upgrade is also more expensive. The standard Hussar upgrade costs 500 food and 600 gold. This one costs 600 food and 800 gold, so it is considerably more expensive than the standard Hussar upgrade. If you can get this upgrade in for pause, you're in for a good time with one of the strongest late game trash units in the game. But it's going to take quite a lot of effort to get this upgrade because, as I said, it's very heavy on gold cost. And if you really want to maximize the abilities of the Wing Hussar, you will need the Lactic Legacy upgrade as well, which is also pretty expensive. Looking at their Siege real quick, they do have Siege Ram available, which is definitely a nice thing to have. Bombard Cannon also available. Heavy Scorpion Siege Honager missing from them. Now, if you look at the Blacksmith, we talked about this already. Missing Ring Archer and Plate Barring Armor is definitely not nice. Overall, their Imperial Age Blacksmith upgrades are sort of underwhelming. So, usually when you play Pause, at least based on the tech tree, you probably want to win early game. Because uh, in early game, they have a very, very diverse tech tree. They do have uh, good Knights, they do have good Archer play as well. So, they definitely have their options early game. Late game is a little bit more underwhelming. Poles were never really a water sieve, so I don't think there is much of a reason to discuss their water tech tree that much. They do have fast fires and galleons available, but dry dock, ship right missing, no heavy demo, no elite cannon galleon. You probably don't want to use poles on water in general. Their university upgrades, they do lack siege engineers, which is a bit of a problem for their bombard cannon play over here. So while they do have bombard cannon available, it's far from ideal, but they do have bombard tower, which is a big thing, I would say. Being able to solidify the positions you have uh, secured is always a nice thing. This definitely makes them a slightly stronger team game civilization, if needed. And now we're getting to the most interesting part of Poe's, most likely, the castle, their unique unit, and their unique upgrades. First off with the unique upgrades, let's talk about Slakta Privileges. This is a fairly cheap upgrade, only costing 500 food, 300 gold, and the knights will cost 60% less gold. That means that each knight costs 30 gold. That is a very, very big discount. Now, this may sound OP, and I am 100% sure that the reason why we are not having the final armor upgrade for the poles over here is because uh, of this upgrade. Otherwise, they would just flood cavalry infinitely in Imperial Age. So, this is better used for uh, games where you have a lot of cavalry in Castle Age. So long Castle Ages. Once we get to Imperial, it's definitely useful, but you have to keep in mind that the cavalry that you're about to spam is sort of underwhelming in quality, especially fighting against archers. So one thing or one place where I can see this one being very useful is a map like Regicide Fortress, for example. If you think about Regicide Fortress, let's say 2v2, um, you are going to have, let's say, a Chinese teammate and... Uh, you will have a castle to start with, so you can get Slakta privileges very early on, and then you can flood knights in Castle Age. So you could go for a very aggressive all-in Castle Age push with this civilization. On standard Arabia-style maps, I don't necessarily see this upgrade becoming a factor very early. Not necessarily because of its own cost, it's because of the fact that it's locked behind a castle. So in order to be able to flood that cavalry, you need to get a castle up, and it's very, very expensive at the beginning. So... 
this may not be that big of a factor on Arabia early on, but it could be very good for uh, maps like Regicide Fortress, as I said, or basically any map where you already start with a castle, so Regicide style maps or special maps where you already have that one going for you. It could be a good one over there, because then you can apply very good castle age pressure. Lechtic Legacy, pretty expensive upgrade, 750 food, 550 gold over here. Light cavalry dealing trample damage, so... It's the same thing as Logistica for the Cataphracts with Byzantines. They, these guys do area damage. Once you get the Vinked Hussar upgrade, which is 800 gold, plus Lechtic Legacy, which is 550, so you would be spending around 1400 gold on the two upgrades. Those Vinked Hussars will be beastly units, and that's the reason why no Habadir and no Final Armor upgrade for the Skirms are available. So, Poles will have to use their Vinked Hussars late game to have a shot in post-imperial situations when gold is running low, but these Vinked Hussars will be beastly, despite the lack of uh, armor at the end over there. The other big thing, and it's a completely new feature to Age of Empires Definitive Edition, is the mechanics of the Polish unique unit, the Obuk. The Obuk is basically an infantry unit comparable to a champion with a completely unique mechanic. It is able to damage the opponent's armor, which means that it is very good against units as most a support unit that have high armor. For example, Paladins have a lot of melee armor and PS armor, Teutonic Knights, Boyars, Malian Champions. So, really, the units that have high armor, he can damage these, and then other units can finish it off. So, for example, teaming this up with Cav Archers against, let's say, Paladins is a very, very nice combination, because these guys do damage the armor of uh, the enemy, and whatever is shooting from the behind, like Arbalests or Cav Archers, they will be able to take down that unit. Their cost is pretty cheap as well, 55 food, 20 gold, and they train pretty fast as well. What's more interesting on them is that they're also pretty decent when it comes to dealing with trash units. So, if you take a look at the champion, a champion does have 1 melee armor, 1 pierce armor, 70 HP, and 13 base attack. A standard Obuk in Castle Age has 80 HP, so higher HP than a champion. 1 extra melee armor, 1 extra pierce armor. The attack is lower, but you have to keep in mind that this is able to damage the opponent's armor. So, once it landed 1 or 2 hits... It's actually much more efficient than a champion that may have to attack through a pretty heavy armor of the opponent. Obuks are still a little bit situational, but these units are also very good at dispatching skirmishers, for example. It can be very good in situations where you're encountering units with uh, high armor. So as I said, Paladins, maybe Boyars, stuff like that. Obviously, they are very, very weak to arrow fire, so they are basically an infantry unit. So Cav Archers, Arbalest, Hand Cannons will still eat them. But uh, this is a very, very good unit for just steamrolling either a bunch of trash units. It might even be better than champions at doing so. And also it's very good for uh, high value, expensive, highly armored units. Looking at the monastery tech tree of uh, Paws over here, you got a pretty decent tech tree, heresy, illumination, and atonement are missing, but they do have block printing and redemption, so they do have a pretty decent answer to bombard cannon as well. Fervor sanctity also available, a little bit underwhelming monastery tech tree, but it still contains the most important upgrades for the monks for pause over here. Looking at their eco upgrades, they are lacking gold shaft mining, probably because they do have uh, their stone miners generate gold in addition to stone over here. They're also lacking two men saw from the lumber camp. The last thing that we need to discuss with Paws is the Fulwark, which is the unique building for Paws over here. It is basically a slightly stronger version of the mill. It costs 125 wood instead of 100, but it also grants five population. So it's more wood efficient than building a house and the mill separately. It also has more HP than a mill, so in case you get men at arms rushed, you have to abandon your uh, berries in Arabia, for example. Then uh, you still have a pretty good shot at keeping this one alive. It's much harder to kill a foil bark than it is to kill a mill. Now, obviously, it's still possible, just like you can lose your mill to a men at arms opening. You can potentially lose your Fallwark as well, and then it hurts quite badly, because you also lose 5 population space, and it's also more expensive building. 
The other thing that is unique with the foil bark is that it immediately collects 10% of the food from nearby newly constructed farms. This is an upgrade that will be, or this is a feature that will be very interesting to look at in the long run. I don't necessarily... Uh, I don't necessarily see this one being uh, super useful on Arabia because it's still risky to build your farms close to the fall arc instead of close to the town center. But this is a very, very good feature for Arena because there it doesn't matter where you build your first initial farms and uh, the fact that it gathers them immediately is uh, actually a very, very nice feature. This will make the Polish build order is very, very unique because, first of all, as I said, you don't build a house and a mill, you build a full arc, and then you probably start building your farms close to it. It will be a pleasure to see the build orders for uh, Poles on maps like Arena, although they are not necessarily an amazing Arena civilization uh, with their tech tree, but they might be at least moderately viable. It's hard to judge what exactly the Poles are currently, I would say, because they do have some characteristics that make them a dangerous civilization on open maps, but they also do have some features like, for example, the good monk tech tree, the fact that their economy is pretty strong as well, the full of arc feature, um, the fact that they do have siege rams, bombard cannons, that make them at least moderately viable on closed maps. For now, it seems like Poles are... Uh, fairly decent all-around civilization, probably more focused on open maps than they are on closed ones. With their primary units, I would say, still being um, Arbalest and uh, maybe even Cav Archer instead of uh, the heavy cavalry style play, I would say that they remind me a little bit to Malians, because in Castle Age they can do a lot of things really well. So they have a strong knight play, they st do have a strong crossbowman play, but later on, they have to probably switch more to the archer style play and support it with Wing Hussars. But as things stand, I don't think that the Polish Cavalier is that viable, or at least not unless you get the Slakta privileges. But I think just by looking at this from the outside perspective, obviously we'll have to see some pro games to be able to determine this one. To me, it feels more legitimate to have some sort of a Cav Archer style play supported by Wing Hussars rather than uh, have this civilization play full cavalier. So, Poles do have quite a lot of diversity. Some positives for late game, especially the Winged Hussar, but in late game the Poles feel a little bit of a one-trick pony civilization, and uh, if the opponent does have Habadiers, then still it could be very troublesome for the Poles to deal with them, because they do lack uh, decent trash units in post-imperial when the gold is running low, so no Habadier. No final armor upgrade for a skirmisher. That is a little bit underwhelming. So whenever you want to play Poles, you probably will have to rely heavily on the Winged Hussar. If you get all the upgrades for them, though, they could be an extremely powerful unit. We'll have to see if they're actually OP or not, but there is a chance they are. Plus, it's going to be a pleasure to see how people will use the Obuchs, because guess what? Those guys bring in a completely new feature of damaging armor, and it's going to be one of the most interesting auxiliary units of the game. With that, we have gone through the tech tree and the overall playstyle of Poles over here. I will soon have a video up as well about the other civilization, the Bohemians. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you have any feedback, I would appreciate if you could post it down in the comments because this is the first time I'm doing a save overview video like this one. So I am definitely open for feedback because I'm far from perfect. Thank you so much for watching and I'm going to see you in the next one.